for example. And there's this great analogy that, um, uh, I'll remember his name in a minute, Al Bregman from McGill Mays, um, who's sort of, he's sort of one of the masters of, of psychology and auditory analysis. And if you, I mean, if everyone closes their eyes for a second, let's do a quick little experiment. Everyone close their eyes. I'm gonna go somewhere and clap. And without opening your eyes, I want you to point to me. Everyone but Lauren got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're yeah. more than right. <laughs> we're pretty, we're pretty accurate at that, right? Very accurate, in fact. Um, and that's just from two little pieces of tissue that wiggle. When that air pressure change went by your head, your brain did a little calculation and knew exactly where that was. It also talked to your memory for a moment and and probably told you it was a hand clap because of the exact change in air pressure. It's sort of like a fingerprint. You remember when I said the sound makes the air pressure go up and down actually thousands of times? Well, the amount it goes up and down and the exact number of times per second it goes up and down, that's like a fingerprint for every sound. You know, you don't have to hear someone on the phone for more than two words and you know who it is. And that's all that's happened, is that you're just from the tissue wiggling, you have this incredible sense of what is happening out there. And Al Bregman makes this analogy to vision and says, you know, we have these two flaps that move, again, thinking we're in this big fluid, and you all know that if you're blindfolded and you walk outside, just from those two flaps moving, you can tell, oh, there's a dog barking behind me, there's a truck a block that way going that way, there's an airplane flying overhead this way. And all of those things are just creating vibrations in this fluid that make your two pieces of tissue wiggle, and your brain analyzes those, those two movements. It's remarkable, really. Those, all those sources, too, that you're parsing out from that additive movement, if you know what I mean, each source is causing a different set of vibrations in the air. And your ear wiggles in some resultant way, all those waves add up, like a piece of styrofoam in a swimming pool. If we were all sitting in a pool together, except for Lauren, and everyone, <laughs> everyone started wiggling hands <coughs> at different rates, there'd be different sort of waves in the water. But a piece of styrofoam in the middle of all of us would be kind of moving in some resultant way to all of those waves that we're causing. <laughs> this is what your eardrum does. It moves in the resultant fashion to all the waves in your environment, but then your brain breaks those back out and knows that it's a dog or a person or what's happening. So Bregman says if vision was the same, you could go to a beach where the, where the water's sliding up on the sand and you can dig a couple of troughs in the water and drop a ping pong ball in each trough of water. And as the water moves through it, if you watch those two ping pong balls wiggle, just by watching them, you could say, oh, there's a boat a mile out moving to the right. There's a scuba diver 10 feet that way, two feet down, swimming that way, and so on. That's, that's quite literally what our brain does with our ears in our environment. Um, so the two words I want everyone to have a handle on uh, are the words we use most when we talk about the properties of sound. Frequency is a word that we use a lot. And intensity, or amplitude. So uh, any first guesses on what we're talking about with frequency, or anyone have an idea? Higher or low sounds? Higher or low sounds, right. So we associate frequency with pitch. Those are two different frequencies. So the property of sound, the way we just described it, that affects frequency, well, what's the difference between these two sounds? What is the difference? One is higher, one is lower. One's higher and lower. And think of frequency as how frequently the air pressure changes. So if I play a tone for you, um, like this one. <clears throat> this is 440 hertz. A favorite tuning note for orchestras. So all that I'm 
doing is telling that speaker, this piece of tissue here, to move back and forth 440 times a second. That's all that's happening. And it's doing it very consistently. And when that sound wave moves past your ears, your eardrums do the same thing, and inside your brain you hear what you heard. So it's, it's funny to think of, you know, we think of sound as this thing, but it's not, this is silent actually, this is just moving. This is just a thing doing this. But in your brain, it constructs that sound. Now, if, it's, if it is that simple, why can't you hear this when I do it? Any guesses? Jake? Lack of intensity. Lack of, it's close. I can, <laughs> I can You're not going to make it. Not so loud. Well, let me, let me just go, let me, let me step back a second. Here's 440 hertz, and here's a more intense 440 hertz. And here's a less intense 440 hertz. It's still moving back and forth 440 times a second, but I'm getting it to move farther or, or less. But the, the frequency of movement is the same. So it's not actually the lack of intensity that you can't hear. What else might it be? Frequency. If I could do this fast enough, I can't do it fast enough for you to hear. So I, I can do this about five times a second if I'm, if I'm lucky. And, and surely there are five increases and decreases in air pressure every second moving by your head when I do this. And your eardrum is moving, but you don't register any sound. The air pressure has to fluctuate at least 20 or 30 times per second before we start to hear sound. I'm going to play 32 hertz and see if. That's low. So we'll just go up in frequency. 32. Here's 125. 220. 20,000 times per second. So, I lost my display. So changes in frequency are perceived as changes in pitch. Higher frequency is a higher pitch. Uh, for those of you associated with music, it's a doubling. It's a logarithmic exchange. So if you have 440 hertz, 880 hertz is one octave above. 1760 hertz is an octave above that. Intensity, changes in intensity are perceived as changes in loudness. So these are the two main things. It's sometimes instead of intensity, we talk about amplitude, but it's the, the, the amount of pressure as opposed to how frequently the pressure is changing. Simple versus complex sound, what we've been listening to are sine waves. They sound sort of artificial. A sine wave is just a mathematical function that describes how that air pressure is going up and down. You've all seen that graph that looks like this. So that's a, sound doesn't do this through the air, which is how people often picture it, but it's, it's, that's a graph of how the air pressure is changing over time. So it's going up, it's going down, it's going up. The air pressure in one place. And if, if that graph follows a sine wave, you hear what we heard just now. It sounds kind of artificial because sound in nature doesn't actually do that very much. Um, we talked about the spring analogy, but when I, when I did this, that sounds a lot different than those tones we were hearing. And the reason is that it contains hundreds, if not thousands, of different frequencies. So breaking those frequencies out, if we think people can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, so there are about 20,000 different tones that we can hear in our range. 
When you get higher than 20, dogs are good up to about 30,000. And lower than 20, thank goodness we can't hear this. You know, it would be like, you'd hear everything. It would be like a lightsaber, you know. <laughs> you could hear every single movement. That would be awful. So to not go crazy, it has to be quite fast. And, uh, and then, I'm not going to talk about it today, but it's interesting that our hearing is very sensitive in certain ranges. So around 3,000 hertz, we're very, very sensitive to that range, which happens to correspond with the sound of like a breaking twig or crackling gravel. So think being hunted, we're, we're very, very sensitive to that range. And it corresponds with the length of our ear canal. It's a little amplifier for those frequencies, which is kind of interesting. Musical instruments. I better see how I'm doing for time as we go. Sorry. Um, musical instruments are extremely complex. So most sounds, if I just go like this, so this table, when I hit it, it vibrates at a whole bunch of different frequencies. Part of the table is moving at 80 hertz, and another part is moving at 1200 hertz. It's moving at a whole pile of different frequencies that aren't really related to one another. So it kind of sounds like noise. When a musical instrument is crafted, an acoustic instrument, part of the art of crafting an instrument is to make it so that when it is set into vibration, either by plucking a string on it or blowing into it, when it's set into vibration, it vibrates, it, it really creates certain frequencies that are musically related. So the harmonic series. If you think of uh, if you think of these octave and musically related frequencies, I won't get into this, but a musical instrument is, is made so that a bunch of frequencies that go together nicely vibrate <coughs> together. That's kind of the difference between a musical instrument and a random object, although some people would differ with me ideologically on that. Uh, and consequently, we have this difference between, I think we all know what we mean in conversation when we talk about acoustic instruments where they sound real or earthy or natural, and then electronic music, which can sound fake. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it, it sounds fake in that, like those tones we were hearing, it just doesn't sound like something we associate with, with the world we live in. You have to artificially create those because any object, when you set it vibrating, vibrates at so many different frequencies. So how we localize sound is interesting. So we talked about you being able to point to me over there. How did that happen? <clears throat> uh, any thoughts on how, how that happened? How did you know where I was? Any ideas? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it like the concept of like stereo? It is. You know, like I, when you were over there, I. I could isolate my right ear getting more frequency or tone or right. intensity than my left, so then I now can Absolutely. assume you must have been over there. Absolutely, so so that's that's part of it. There's three reasons, there's three things we do to localize, and that is absolutely one of them. So if, I, if a sound is coming from over there, it's gonna be a little louder in my right ear than in my left ear, right? That makes sense. My head sort of casts an acoustic shadow over this ear. So if a sound wave is coming from there, it's louder here than here. Now, that explains generally how we can locate over here. But we're actually really good at knowing if that sound went from there to right there, to right there, to right there. We're quite good at that. That's actually done by timing differences. So those, those hundreds and thousands of air pressure changes coming at you, they reach this ear first, and then they reach that ear. So the time difference between each year, the different intensity in each year, and actually we use reflections off of, your brain knows your pattern of in it, your little, all these little ridges and stuff on your ear, your brain knows yours. So this is more for vertical stuff, but if there's a sound coming from down here, part of that sound reflects off your ear and your brain knows which parts will reflect so it can locate and stuff. We're more interested in the horizontal plane today. Let's see how you did it. This is you. This is your ear. Here's a sound. 
didn't work. There it is. Let's say it's over there where I was. <clears throat> so this pressure wave moves out from the sound, slowly apparently. Sound moves more quickly than this. It reaches that ear first, and then the exact same wave, which is fingerprint-like, reaches the other ear. So your brain says, well, no two things are really exactly the same. So if I got the exact same thing, X number of microseconds later, the sound must be there. And it does this quick little calculation based on the timing difference. This is critical in recording. The timing difference and the amplitude difference. So in recording, you have musicians. Let's say we have a singer, a guitar player, a piano player, and a drummer. We set up a couple of microphones. And again, I'm talking today mostly about classical and jazz music recording, acoustic music recording, where we apply these stereophonic hearing principles more often than in pop recording. We do use it in pop, but not as much. So in, part of the reason is in classical recording, as we'll hear, a lot of times the goal of the recording is to make it sound like it would if you were sitting right in front of, of the group. So it's better if we use principles of hearing to do that than say put a microphone on each instrument and then artificially balance them in the speakers. It's more convincing, as I hope we'll hear. So we have two microphones. Now this is a bird's eye view. The group is facing this way, which would make this the left microphone, and this one the right microphone. And as we saw with your own hearing system, if the piano plays, the sound wave moves out and it strikes the right microphone first and a short bit of time later strikes the left microphone. So when we play it back, if we just plug each microphone into a stereo set of speakers, there you are listening with your speakers properly placed. That's actually not the right way. The way recordings are made are an equilateral triangle. So this distance should be the same as you to each speaker. If you want to set up your home speakers just so, to really get the most out of your recordings, it's an equilateral triangle with your speakers. So we take the left microphone, plug it into the left speaker, the right microphone, plug it into the right speaker, and then the sound reaches the listener, but remember, let's look at the piano, for instance. It hit this first, and then hit this one. So that means this speaker is going to reproduce that sound first and then the speaker will reproduce it after. And the listener then, your brain creates this little image. And you, you actually see it in front of you between the speakers. So we call it the phantom image. And hopefully you'll see in the recordings we play that the speakers don't really, you won't hear sound coming from there and from there. You, you'll see the, the group in front of you. Uh, let's listen to some of those. I'm going to play a recording that was done in, in this space. <coughs> um, this is a Baroque music recording. When we record Baroque music, we're really looking for a long reverb time. It, the music is just suited by, this room has a nice reverb, but it's short. Think of how long you hear the clap after. It's sort of gone about a second later. Those, those are the, the reflections are bouncing around for about a second. In a Baroque recording, you want about three or four seconds of time. So really, really lush. Uh, this is an example of the ensemble is up here. We have two microphones, a left and a right microphone in front of the ensemble. The goal of this recording is that it sounds like it would being right here, watching the group.
couple of other things here. Who is the tenor? Uh, Matthew White, the counter tenor. Passeroni. something here's a guitar an acoustic guitar recording that should image in the center but there are two microphones on the guitar and they're they're hand wide so the guitar will, will hopefully seem a bit larger than than what is natural <laughs> Here's another Paul. Now in this recording, again, we have two microphones. And I should say, like in that Baroque recording, the way you balance, it's up to the musicians to balance. So if you're the ensemble being recorded, and we put two microphones up here. If we go back and listen to it, and maybe, maybe we're hearing too much of Derek in the recording, all we can do is say, Derek, can you either play more quietly or maybe move back? And so what we end up doing in these recordings with two mics is adjusting where the musicians are exactly to adjust where they appear in the finished recording. So a string quartet, hopefully, actually there's a picture of the group. Uh, <coughs> it is the that band, yeah. So you have first violin, second violin, uh, sorry, first violin, viola, cello, second violin, and hopefully that will come, sorry, first and second violin, cello and viola. Um, and we'll try and hear that. Quite a, a, a while to get to this point, 
and not every string quartet will end up there. Sometimes you, so the sound check, you're, you're moving mics an inch, you're moving them this way and that, or raising them a foot or two. It depends on the environment you're in. And you can see we pulled these reflectors up behind them because we found we were getting, in the sound check, we were getting too much of the, of the hall and it was too blurry. What happens in a concert, uh, your brain plays an enormous role in how you perceive what you're hearing. So when you see the instruments, it's a lot easier to kind of shut out other things that you're hearing. And it's interesting. The next time you're at a concert, close your eyes for a while and listen for a while. And you'll, you'll notice that you, you hear more of the environment and less of the, of the instrument. So we're always trying to find, to strike that right balance. Uh, I mean, the short answer is there's no brain attached to the microphone. Yeah. To, deal with all that. So it, it is finding a compromise. And it depends on the sensitivity of the particular microphones. So if we use a different model of mic, we might have to go closer to get the same closeness or same balance between the instruments in the room. But the key in a, in a clear sounding, I mean, what, what's nice about these recordings is I think they sound very real and natural. And part of that is due to the fact that we're using two microphones. So you have sound being created, and how mi microphones and speakers are exactly the same technology. They're, they're the same thing. So you have the left microphone is a piece of tissue that's reacting to the sound the way your left ear would, and we're plugging it in to the speaker, and that's it, that's all. The speaker does exactly what the microphone did. So it really is clean and unprocessed in that way, and that's part of what makes it sound so real and natural. In a, Another approach to this recording would be to put a close microphone on each instrument and then that microphone would be moving as if you were up close to the instrument so you could argue that it would be a clearer sound. But when you have two speakers, you end up combining those things. So now you've got a mic over here and a mic over here and you combine the outputs of those and the speaker moves in a resultant way of, of those mics moving. And that's less natural because each mic, especially in a group like this, they're not all isolated. So even if you put a microphone on the first violin, there's a bit of cello sound getting into that microphone. So now you're combining that with the cello mic, and now you've muddied up the cello because it got to that mic later than it got to the cello mic. So all of these things, when you use a whole bunch of microphones, you kind of you trade off that natural stereoness that we have. Does, does that make sense? Question? Why, why are uh, why are the bassier instruments on the right and the higher ones on the left? Is that difficult? Yeah, it is. I mean, sometimes you see these two reverse. Sometimes you'll see violins and then viola and then the cello on the outside. But you, but you don't think so. <laughs> it's a historical. Yeah. No. It's it's they they've been playing like that for for their whole lives. Okay. Or some very close iteration. The two on the left. Some people, because the cello doesn't isn't as intense an instrument, there's a lot of folks who feel that when it's side to the audience, <coughs> it doesn't it doesn't get out there as much. But but you have the same problem with the viola. So you'll often see. I mean, she's turned because we're recording. But in a concert, she'd be more out like this, so her instrument's facing out to get as much out to the audience as possible. But you really have to play with it. Another example of uh, two or four mics, sometimes we'll supplement. This was a choir and cello. So there's a cellist here. And then we just have four mics across the top. Now the two are serving the same purpose that we had. But when we listen to it, the people that were really far on the outside, we weren't getting enough of them. So because of the width of the ensemble, we've added another left microphone and another right microphone, and those were added in. Uh, <coughs> play a little bit of this is a modern composition that was written after Hurricane Katrina.
got a sense of the size of the group. It's not actually, it wasn't a very nice hall. We had to do a lot of work just to get it to sound uh, close. Some of these comments actually, maybe we'll edit the video after. Um, solo instruments. I wanted to play something at this session, um, in a you jazz session. Yeah. Do you have those reflectors above them? Would the sounds just disappear if they muted up in New Zealand? Or? Yeah, this was a lecture hall at the University of Wisconsin okay. and um, or University of Connecticut in Wisconsin. In Ma Ma Madison, Wisconsin. Anyway, University of Wis Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, the ceilings were way too high. It was three tiers and the sound was just going away. It sounded really tiny and small. So we lowered those down and it just helped to make like a smaller room. You'll often see at an orchestral, they'll have clouds floating over the orchestras in concert halls. And that's to help. It's like the lid of a piano. It serves the same function. Pushes that sound out to the audience. The waves that go up pushes them out. Uh, here's a jazz recording of um, the smaller photo here, but if I can. Studio that was actually an old barn that had been converted. Um, into quite a nice studio, actually. But the reason I want to play it is we're applying now these stereo principles to each instrument individually. So two microphones on the piano. Uh, these two microphones take up the drums. But for instance, they're, they're the same distance from the snare drum, so the snare drum comes up in the middle of the recording because the two mics, we put them so that the sound reaches them at the same time. And if you want the snare drum in the recording to be moved over a bit, then you lower the left mic.
that's it, unless there's other questions. I just, yeah. I'm curious about the psychology yeah. of STEM. Um, I had a program the other day with a TV drama, and uh, there's a woman at the piano who's elderly, and when somebody talks to her, it's obviously she's got Alzheimer's disease, etc. And yet when she turned back to the keyboard, it was perfect. So there was no Alzheimer's in her playing, but there was in her speech. And the protagonist made a comment about the muscle memory is he gone. So that's why she's able to play. In terms of listening, do we have a muscle memory? Um, in terms of listening, well, absolutely. We, we, we have. The interesting thing about listening is it actually engages many different areas of the brain. So you, you, I haven't heard it described as a as a as a, me a muscle memory, but when you when you listen, you are engaging your motor cortex mm -hmm. and your both areas of your memory, your short and long term. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it actually, I mean, it's really interesting. Now that we can look at MRIs while people do things. So if you, if you have someone listening to music while they're in an MRI, more areas of the brain are engaged than in totally. doing any other activity. I mean, more areas just light up with, with music listening. And then there's, so there's a physical uh, component, but it also taps into your memory. You, you know how you feel when you hear that song that was popular when you were 13? For a moment, you have this, it's, it's, it's profound. You get this sort of, you're, you're sent back there for a moment. It's not just that you remember the song. It taps into your emotions and into your, you know, all of that stuff. So it's, it's an all-encompassing, I mean, it's early days in mm -hmm. studying the brain for, for sound, for sure. But what they do see is just this quantity thing that's remarkable, that how, how much music uh, taps into all areas of, of your brain. So things like that, I mean, her experience, I, I'd be interested to know if she could still learn new music. Maybe she couldn't. Mm -hmm. that, that might, the learning component would be more affected by her Alzheimer's than recalling yeah. uh, motor skills. And, and obviously if her Alzheimer's was causing her not to be able to recall people she knew, that's quite a different place than your motor yeah. place. So I think that's the implication of the piece. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I'd be interested in your, your comments on the difference between listening and hearing. <laughs> um, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hearing, listening. Um, yeah, it's uh, very different. Yeah, I mean, I hearing know. to me, if the mechanism works, yeah. if your if your flaps are flapping, yeah. and your brain is conjuring yeah. up something in your head, you're hearing. But that's very different yeah. from engaging the rest of your brain and paying attention. Yeah. So it's a to me, it's a simple attention difference. Yeah. It's the active listening, we yeah. call it. Yeah. It's, is engaging purposefully. And I mean, we've let our mind wander when we've read. You know what it's like to read and not really read. Right. I don't know how in reading if there are two words, <laughs> like there are hearing and listening. Yeah. It's seeing reading, and reading. Like seeing, seeing and reading. reading. Yeah. Yeah. So it's seeing and reading. Yeah. Yeah. Active, passive kind of Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Explain this. This is something I, I, I read and I, I, I don't understand it. When the Beatles recorded, in the early day six, they were recorded in mono. Yeah. And then with the stereo, the stereo came. They would record in mono, and then they would not record in stereo. They would yeah. leave, and the engineers, the, the yeah. engineers yeah. would then take what was in mono, put it to stereo, and 50 to 60 percent of the time that happened, it didn't come out as well as the mono. But can yes. you yeah. take mono and actually Switch it over. Full stereo. Only recently can you sort of do that with computers. It's not that clean. Remember the whole resultant wave thing? If you truly record to mono, like really combine all the sounds and record one signal, it's nearly impossible to go back and parse those individual instruments out the way your brain does. Although there are some software pieces that are trying to do it now, to, like they take all 20,000 frequencies and identify which ones are which instrument, and they try, and it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. But back then, no. They, what they were doing is they were recording to four tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were doing the true mono first, and then when four tracks came out, they would record drums on one track. But it wasn't like here with two mics, they just put one mic over the drums. Uh, and 
and, and they record drums and then maybe voice and guitar and bass. So they'd have four tracks. And then to make the mono release, the engineer would decide, would combine them all, they'd just listen to one speaker, and combine them all in there, and then change things with the sound and the balance to make it sound as good as it could on one speaker. When stereo came along, they realized, okay, we've got two speakers to work with now, but we still have these four tracks, and drums are still on one track. So we can't spread the drums out, but we could put drums over there, and voice over here, and bass over there, and guitar over here. So you hear some of those records that are a bit, you hear the drums are completely on one side, or some instrument yeah. over there. A lot of that was that happening. Um, in recording, they started realizing, you know, two mics on two tracks could then go to two speakers after. And I don't, I don't know that that happened with the Beatles at all. They, they certainly went to eight track after, and they actually went to eight track before everyone else did. They figured out how to sync two four tracks together uh, loosely and and kept going. So it's, but really they were doing mono a whole bunch of times and then trying to put that in two speakers. Rather than truly doing stereo recording, if that makes sense. Yeah. And some, and you do have dummy head microphones. I should have brought a picture of one. But to really get that sense, there are microphones that are. It, it looks like a mannequin head, but the mics are inside it, so the diaphragms are right where your eardrums would be. And you plop the mic in the best seat in the house because of those reflections, right? So it really gets the recording from that seat. Those recordings sound perfect on headphones, but they don't sound so great on speakers. Like I was saying before with those two mics over the quartet, you kind of have to make up for the fact that there's no brain attached. And, and when you hear speakers, remember this, the sound coming out of this is reaching both of your ears. That's the chief difference between speakers and headphones. Headphones, you're one speaker, one ear. So there's a clarity in headphones. You're basically coupling each speaker to your eardrum, so your eardrum is doing only what that speaker did. There's a real clarity there. When you listen on loudspeakers, each speaker reaches both of your ears, so there's a bit less clarity, but that can be nice. Um, I forget where I started there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's been a lot of discussions of things on Jerry's point, uh, you know, the factors of famous book, The Brain on Music. Yeah, the Daniel Levin. Yeah, music has a very, very profound, transcendent effect on, on the way you think. And, I'm sorry, Ron. He has no baby music. Still does. So, <laughs> but um, did you hear it? Yeah, oh yeah, very nice. Now, when I put that over here, he <laughs> <laughs> um, comments, I know it's a big topic, but it's uh, fun. Just that it's well, um, yeah. I mean, let that the music on stimulating quite wonderful, not just memories but other. Uh, yeah. Well, this is what happened. I mean, his that book, and he's got a couple other things, and and the, this whole movement, I think, is born out of the new medical ability to actually take some reasonable measurements of what the heck the brain is doing. Yeah. Everything else has been up to up to this the new form of studying the brain is has really been behavioral science where they can, they can play sounds and then ask you questions. It's one step removed rather than actually watching what your brain is doing. And uh, so I think Levitin's mostly speaking to that, mostly in, in This Is Your Brain on Music, he's mostly talking about, um, well, he brings up some of the cases like the, the Alzheimer's patient where people have these very interesting anomalies, interesting bits of damage that tell us about what certain parts of the brain are doing. So I don't know if anyone in here is tone deaf, or if, if you, can you repeat sound? Like if I go, can you sing that back? There you go, so you're, some people can't do that. But they can, they can enjoy music just the same. They, they might have a problem with their motor cortex, and it's actually the control of their vocal cords they have an issue with. The perception of sound can be the same as you and me. They actually can't mimic, and some people can't, it, it, it's, so it's, it's learning all these little things and saying, wow, the experience of sound is so rich. It, it affects us physically, in a memory way, emotionally, um, spatially. It tells us about our world. And so there's this whole new branch of psychology that's opened up on auditory 
perception that tries to break out all the little components of that. I think, yeah, it's an exciting field. We, we may have touched on it earlier, but the, the whole area of music therapy oh, yeah. and, 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 and bringing the Alzheimer patients from a lost state miraculously almost back to recalling with yeah. vivid memory what they were doing when they heard a particular piece of music. Yeah, that's also an exciting field because that's been around a long time, but it has suffered from a bit of voodoo criticism until recently. Yeah. You know, now that the measurables are, are undeniable in that field, like it, it is it affects you physically. 